see the boy I used to be? Could you tell him that I'd like to find? left of me could you spare him a little kindness cause I've been high and I've been low I've spent a thousand nights alone trying to hold on tight feelings come but they won't go Please won't someone take me home Before I lose my mind Am I broken? Oh, am I flawed? Do I deserve a shred of words? Or am I just another fake, messed up, lost cause? And am I human? Or am I something else? Cause I'm so scared there's no one there to save me from the nightmare that I call myself. I've tried everything and anything, but nothing seems to work quite like it should. And the apathy Seems there's nothing left Inside of me That's good Cause I've been high And I've been low I spent a thousand nights alone Trying to hold on tight These feelings come Please won't someone take me home before I lose my mind Am I broken? Am I flawed? Do I deserve a shred of words? Just another fake, messed up, lost cause And am I human? Or am I something else? Cause I'm so scared there's no one there Save me from the nightmare that I call myself Oh, I'm so scared there's no one there To save me from the nightmare that I call myself Have you uh, been there? Have you sung that song? Maybe not that very particular song, but sung those words at some place in your soul. I think we all have. In fact, I think if you're following Jesus, <coughs> he takes you there. He, he wants to take you there. And when you're there, it's a very lost place, but you're on the edge of something, 
and you're able to see something that you can't see when you're not there. And so he brings us all to that place. Well, <clears throat> you could be there from a general feeling, right? I mean, there, there are people that I know, that you know, that kind of live in that place. They kind of seem to exist there. Or it could be you're, you're there because of a, of a very specific something. Maybe, maybe something happened in your past and you just keep replaying it in your mind. Maybe you're in a situation right now that you can't escape and don't know how to change or make it different. Maybe it's something you're looking in the future and going, that's coming down the road and I can't seem to stop it. What is that? What is it to be in this place where you say, am I, am I worth anything? Does God see me? Well, I, I think of a story. In fact, this was back when uh, I lived at Peter's house. Well, his folks' house. We were both teenagers. And I moved in there when I went to college. That's kind of how Peter and I got to know each other. And how he's become a brother to me and I to him and his dad became a father to me. But they would always have people over for dinner. And I remember this one guy who came, I, I'm not sure how he ended up there. I guess he went to the church and just got invited to come. And as I, I'd ask him questions and he seemed kind of melancholy and not evasive, but not particularly engaged, but as people left the table, it was just a couple of us sitting there with him, and uh, I finally found out he worked at Martin Marietta, uh, that's what it was called back then before it was Lockheed Martin, Martin Marietta uh, as an engineer, and then he finally, it, and I was asking about his family, he said, well, I don't know who my mom or dad is, I'd never met them, see, I was, I was a botched late-term abortion and the nurse took me out of the trash and saved my life. And, and as the shock was waving over me, he looked at me and he said, you know, sometimes I wonder if God really loves me. And I thought the amazing part of that statement was he said sometimes, right? That, that, that there were moments he believed God loved him. Now, I could sit there and go, I, I know God loves you. I mean, you're a walking miracle. Your story is profound and dramatic and all these things that, you know, make for good little sermon illustrations. But the fact that he would walk through that place and had to carry that, it, it made me go, God, what, what are you doing? How does all this work? I mean, all powerful, all loving, and yet... And one of the things, I, you know, especially now that I'm getting older and a lot of my friends, they're, they're having to take care of their parents. And I just had a recent conversation with someone who said, you know, my mom has served the Lord her whole life. She's given everything, sacrificed everything, and now she's in the hospital and all this suffering, and it doesn't seem like it's going to end. And what is God doing? Why, why does he treat his own like this? And it reminds me, whenever I hear stories like that, I think of uh, an author that I really like, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who wrote Cost of Discipleship. And I like the book because... He explains, hey, if you really want to get the most out of this Christian life, there's a discipline you have to bring to it. And it's not a book of, hey, you got to do all these things so God will like you. It's, it's you need to discipline yourself so you can see better and walk better. And the amazing thing about Dietrich Bonhoeffer is he was a pastor during the Nazi regime from, and from 39 to 45. And if you remember, the war ended... Uh, May 8th, 1945, that's when Germany surrendered, all the prison camps were freed and everything, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer went through that whole process up until April 9th, 1945, 29 days before the liberation of Germany, and he was hanged in a concentration camp for speaking against Germany. 
And I sit there and look at that and go, this, this is a guy who stood up for everything and 29 days before it's over, you let him die like that? What are you doing? And, you know, I, I've had a number of medical things Peter mentioned, and there was one point when it what came to the second eye surgery that I was, God, what, what is this? What did I do wrong? What do you want me to change? And when I look at Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I, I think the mistake that we make, or I look at this man who is a saved botched abortion, I, I think the mistake we make is, well, my situation isn't as bad as theirs. I don't think that's good comparison. I don't, I don't think our life should find joy in the fact that it's not as bad as somebody else. There's something deeper going on because Bonhoeffer went through something that you didn't. That guy at the dinner went through something you didn't. My eye surgeries are different than surgeries you've had. But yet you're going through something or have gone through something or will go through something that's going to take you to the edge. So what is God doing? And does he see us? And more importantly, does he care? Well, when I look around, and this is something that uh, I really enjoy, the fact that we're all so profoundly unique. You know, a lot of you I've met. Some of you, you know, I don't know, but this is one thing that's for sure. There is no other you. You're it. The thing that makes you, you, is different than the thing that makes anybody else who they are. And you, you have a uniqueness that's unduplicated through all of history. You'll never come again. You're it. And when I meet you, there's a profound mystery about you. That, in fact, that uniqueness, you're so unique, and there's such a mystery about you. You've lived with yourself. How many years? I mean, count the years. You know how old you are, right? You lived with yourself all this time, and you still don't know who you are. You still don't understand yourself and your desires and your motivations. And that's amazing to me. It's, it's like it would take eternity to get to know you. Huh. There's a bit of a design there. But where does that come from? That uniqueness, that profound thing. And yet, there's a similarity between us all, right? I mean, we kind of all walk on two feet, and we think and reason, and we use our hands, and unless there's some medical issue that interferes with all that, we move around the same, we kind of think about things the same. And uh, when, when I think of cultures around the world, there are distinctions in cultures, but we're also profoundly similar, yet so profoundly unique. What is that? What is humanity? Well, I, I, I love this set of verses here, and it starts with uh, Genesis 2, where God kind of tells us, here's where your uniqueness comes from, and here's where the profoundness of being human comes from. Starting Genesis 2, 7, then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature, Job 32, 8. But it is the spirit of man. So what is your spirit? Your spirit is the breath of the Almighty. It is the spirit of man, the breath of the Almighty, that makes him understand. This breath of God that's in you, that's in each of us, is what animates our spirit, makes something unique, yet also makes something very human, that, that part of us that can reason and see and be sentient and creative and self-reflective. Uh, self Isaiah, the, uh, thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out and spread out the earth and what comes from it. So this is Isaiah's po poetic way saying, I'm talking about the guy who made everything. This is what he's saying. 
who gives breath to people on it, on the earth, and spirit to those who walk in it. So who gets this breath of God? Is it unique to somebody who makes a particular pronouncement or grew up in a particular place? Or This breath of God is in everyone who walks the earth. They all have it. We all have it. The breath, the breath, the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord searching all the innermost parts. You know, when you start having these self-reflections and wonderings and, and it start exploring, you know what that is? That's God in you. That's his spirit in relation to your spirit moving you through. And it's really hard to know where the two are different and where the two are the same. But here's, here's the thing. You have the breath of God, the very image of God, the life of God in you. And as you sit here, because of that, you have infinite worth. Your value cannot be measured, can't be contained, can't be quantified. You And the person next to you, behind you, and in front of you, has infinite worth. And there's nothing you can do to change the worth. It's it's imparted to you from God. It's his breath in you animating your spirit that gives you eternal worth. So the good news is there's nothing you can do to diminish your worth. And in another way to put it, the bad news is there's nothing you can do to increase your worth. And yet, we kind of live life like we want to increase it. We want to define what makes us worthwhile and what doesn't. We want to create self-worth. I I want to be able to say, hey, I'm worth something because I've done X, or I know why, or I've, I've been to certain places, or I've seen certain things, and now I have a worth. Well, that's not where your worth comes from. Your worth comes from the very image of God breathed into you, and you can't ch- change that. You know, I, I think of uh, Psalms 8, which is kind of an amazing verse, Psalms 8 is where uh, God says, look, I made man a little lower, and the term he uses is, is God. I made man a little lower than God and crowned him with glory and honor. Even back 2,000 years ago when, they tra- when the Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, when the people that translated the Septuagint, they changed the word God to angel because they were like, this, this sounds a little <laughs> new agey. Uh, of course, they had every belief system under the sun. What we call new age now, they, had, they, had, they called something different. But the sense of God saying, you're a little low, I made you a little lower than me. You're not me, you're not God, but there's divine attributes that you carry around because my breath is in you and has formed you and keeps you living. In fact, Job goes on to say that every breath you breathe is given to you by God. And at one point, he's gonna stop giving you breath and then you leave this world. So this, this thing that is you is really unique and quite profound. In fact, you're so unique that God will pursue you for eternity, because he wants a relationship with you he cannot have with anyone else. You know, it's, it's almost like if, if there were a hundred sheep and one of them strayed, he'd go after that one to bring them back. He'd go after you to bring you back. That's how valuable you are to him. This infinite value that he wants in relationship with him. Well, If you tie your worth, if you decide, hey, I'm gonna tie my worth to a skill or a title or an object, you are setting yourself up for catastrophe. 
because, I, you know, I've been around a, a little bit, and I've seen lots of people not get to promotion, lots of people lose the house, lots of people lose body parts and functionality, and if your worth is tied to those things, when those things go, you disintegrate. So what do we tie it to? Well, you didn't breathe your breath in you. God breathed that in you. It's already that your your worth is already there. Problem for most of us, including me, I just don't see it. I don't or I don't believe it. In fact, there's uh, there's a time where uh, things get so bad. <laughs> a lot of us decide, uh, you know, I think it's easier to believe there is no God. Right, we call that atheism. Right, Life gets so complicated and so painful that we embrace this idea where there can't be a God. And that's really a convenient belief, right? I mean, if there's no God, then none of this has to make any sense. You just kind of live out your days and then you die and okay. Well, to be an atheist um, really takes a profound, uh, a pretty heavy-duty thinking and a profound amount of faith. I mean, because obviously, you know, just like to the atheist, those of us who believe there's a God, we can't prove, no, here's God, now you got to see him. You can't prove there's a God, just like the atheist can't prove there's not a God, so both are just these massive leaps of faith. And to argue an atheistic argument is, is pretty strong because even mathematically, evolutionary-wise, we've only been here 13 billion years. So either for us to have evolved out of chance, either there's not enough stuff or there's not enough time for us to get to where we are. So atheists have to struggle with that. In fact, it, it reminds me of... Uh, a friend of mine who, this was a long time ago, and he worked with me in the church and this sort of thing, and he decided he was going to go start leaving, living more of a hedonistic life. And I went to visit him just to see how he was doing, and he said, hey, you need to know, I'm an atheist now. And I said, no offense, but you're not smart enough to be an atheist. And uh, he... <laughs> He thought for a second, he said, what is it when you don't know if there's a God? I said, that's an agnostic. He said, well, I'm an agnostic. I said, you can be an agnostic. I can believe that. That's good. Because the amount of energy, the amount of mental gyrations being an atheist are pretty profound. In fact, one of the best atheists is most articulated and well-argued atheist, Richard Dawkins. And if you really want to understand an atheist argument, get a Richard Dawkins book. He's alive now, and he's written quite a few books, and he has a great atheist argument. But in an interview, when he was being challenged about the fact that humans exist, I mean, here we are with this amazing ability to self-reflect and to create. He he said, uh, and they said, well, how did humans get here? And Dawkins said, well, I think aliens planted human DNA here. And I remember hearing that going, okay, that's what he needs to do to make sense of it scientifically. But the problem is, all he did was move the question 100 million light years away. I mean, the question still remains over there. There wasn't enough time or stuff over there for this advanced race to move around and come here and play. So the question still remained unanswered, which means a tremendous amount of faith and brace there. But... I think the beauty is, at least to me, what's easier to believe is this idea of looking at you and the profound mystery that is you. You have the breath of God. You're a little lower than God in your ability and and in your imagination. And what does this mean? I mean, one of the things I think it it, it means you can self-reflect, right? You can observe yourself observing 
observing, observing yourself, which is very profound in its own right, but it also means you can create. You can, in your imagination, you can think of something and you can bring it into reality. That's an amazing image of God thing. And I'm not talking like a robin building a nest. I mean, if you go around and look at robin's bird nests, they're kind of all the same. And if you look at hummingbird nests, they're all kind of the same. I mean, the species per species, how they kind of build their home and everything. You look at a human's home, my guess is nobody's home here is the same. And if structurally on the outside it happens to be, on the inside it's certainly not. And what is that? That's a reflection of you, a reflection of your thoughts, and a reflection of your desires. Even if it's not everything you want it to be, you kind of know what you'd like it to be. You've driven towards it. That ability to create is part of being in the image of God. And that image of God that is us has created all kinds of things. Medical advancements, whole cities. It, it, it's profound what we are able to do. And that's the image of God in you being lived out. And one of the saddest things to me is somebody sitting around going, yeah, I, I'm worthless, I can't do anything. I'm going, wow, you just robbed yourself of a whole bunch of life by living in, living in that belief. Well, you didn't bring your, breathe your own life into you. God breathed it in. And which, and I, and I want to sit on this because, you know, that song is so, it's a real powerful song. And I know it's sung, when we sing that, the other thing that's in our mind is, I think it's time for me to end this life. I mean, that, I I really believe Jesus brings us all to that point at one point or another. Statistically, at least 10% in this room should be at that point. Maybe not, but that's where you statistically will be. And as we get to this point, there's one thing I, I, I really want you to, to get. Because God breathed his life into you and animates his spirit, I, I hear this all the time, he took his own life. And I think, no, he didn't. He stole that life from God, and then he stole that life from the rest of us. He didn't take his life. It wasn't his to take He robbed it from God and robbed it from the rest of us. And now we're without that unique individual in this world. So if you're there, realize God's doing something at a profound level with you right in this moment that you won't be able to see or know like you can right now. And those of you who aren't there, there and not there, here's the point. you need to embrace this infinite worth that you have. And not only in you, but in the people around you. You know, we, to survive life, we tend to make each other really small, right? I, I, it's really easy for me to say, you're the good folks, you're the bad folks. In fact, that's, that's that, that fallenness in me that wants to be the judge of all. Good folks, bad folks. I'll hang out with you, I'll dismiss you. And we, we've watched the church through the ages dismiss whole swatches of folks because they didn't dress right or say the right words or whatever, and I'm, think, I'm thinking we're missing something so profound about each of us, our own uniqueness. And to think of each person you encounter as a unique breath of God that you're talking with, that really complicates things. It's a whole lot easier to chew somebody out for being rude to you or to curse them for cutting you off on the road. It's a whole other deal when you look and go, well, there's a breath of God. I wonder what's going on with them. Well, I think it's important for you to explore your uniqueness. There's lots of ways you can do it. There's all kinds of assessment like 
DISC and Myers-Briggs and Strength Finders, and these help understand, hey, here's how you're wired, here's what makes you unique. They don't define you, but they're like discovery tools, and we're not gonna go into that, we don't have time to go into that, but I really do challenge you for you to, to explore how are you unique? What makes you who you are? Because when God breathed in you, he had, he had thoughts about who you are. He created who you are. And I think for you to explore that is divine. The, the interesting thing is uh, just don't weaponize who you are, right? I, I watch people going, well, this is who I am, and if you don't accept me, well, get it, and they start chewing it. And it's, I'm going, it, it would be a whole lot better for us to learn how to deal with being offended, how to overcome offense, than to teach people how, more ways to be offended, which seems to be what our culture is doing today. Let me, let me show you how to really get upset. And uh, two Proverbs. Proverbs 10, 12. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. Proverbs 19.11, good sense makes one slow to anger, and it's glorious to overlook an offense. So be glorious. Here's another way to say it. Treat others the way you'd like to be treated. I think Jesus said something like that, didn't he? Well, we've gone through all this, and maybe you're still feeling worthless, right? And you're going, well, okay, God's image, infinite value, and everything. I, I get that and believe that, but I'm, I'm still feeling worth, worthless. Let me just say this. You should, because you are. They go, whoa, hold on. What do you mean, I am? You are. You're worthless. In fact, there's stuff, there's stuff I've done that I look at and go, well, that was crap. That hurt a lot of people. That was totally selfish. That only served me. In fact, I'm real good at that. I'm real good at kind of getting the situations all lined up so it all gets what I want, and if people kind of get a little hurt, well, they'll get over it. I mean, you know, people are tough. Things that, <laughs> the other piece that's kind of frustrating is things that I've done that I think are just awesome, that are great, I look at them a little longer or some other people point out, yeah, that wasn't so great. That wasn't so good. And they turn out to be nothing. Anything, here's, here's, here's the deciding factor. What makes something worth, worth? What makes something not worth? Is love. So why are you worth something? Because God loves you. He breathed his life into you. God loves the whole world that he sent his only son. So you have worth because God loves you and breathed that into you. And nobody can change the fact that God loves you. Cannot be changed. And it's an infinite love which imparts an infinite worth. But you and me, we do a lot of things that are void of love. And when we do and live and breathe in those areas... It's nothing, and it's worth nothing. Look, look, at, uh, look at this verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 13. This, this, is, uh, this is an amazing verse. We, we use this in weddings a lot, right? The love chapter, which I think this first part kind of gets lost in the whole wedding, wedding stuff. But uh, it says... If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, so have this amazing spiritual gift of tongues, right? Not just of human languages, but angelic languages. But have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Now, it, Paul's not just saying you're making worthless noise. This is how you worship Zeus down the street in Paul's day. Because the priests would hit gongs and clang cymbals. So he's saying, look, if you do these great things Christian spiritual things like speak in tongues, but you don't have love, well, you might as well just be down the street worshiping Zeus. 
And if I have prophetic powers, now we're getting into like the Marvel stuff, right? Marvel movies. Prophetic powers. Understand all mysteries and all knowledge. Man, we love knowledge, right? No one th- I'm, I remember in high school when I was trying to study and keep up and everything, I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could just put my hands on the corner of a library and suck all the knowledge out of all those books and I'd know all that stuff. That would just be awesome. We really venerate people that know a lot of stuff and think of somebody who can look at a mystery and understand it. You know, you think of people like Tesla from the past that looked into electricity and go, oh, wow, you discovered all those mysteries. You're really amazing. Well, if I could do all that and have prophetic powers, I could look into the future and know your future and help you with that. Wouldn't that just be amazing? And if I have all faith, the kind of faith that can move mountains when I tell them to move, but have not love, what am I? I'm nothing. If I give away all I have, I mean, now we're talking those external things that really look Christian, right? I give away all I have, and I deliver my body to be burned. I I lay my life down as a martyr. Now I've done it, right? Now now I'm, I'm good to go. But have not love, I've gained nothing. I gain nothing, I am nothing. Well, here's, here's the reality about you. And cultures have known this through all time. You know, it, you're, there's two things happening in you. There are two parts of you. There's this God-breathed divine part, and there's this part you're trying to create apart from God that you're trying to manufacture so that you can say, I don't need God. I don't want God. I want I want." My own thing. I want, to, I want to decide what's right and wrong. I want to decide good and evil. I want to define all those things. And those two are in opposition, and it's part of giving you your own consciousness, sentience, free will. This is, this is where this struggle takes place. Well, through all time, societies, cultures have known this. So in China, they call it the yin and yang in that culture. In the Egyptian culture, it's Osiris and Set. The Persians, Ahura Mazda and Oja. Plato called it the soul and the body. Freud called it ego id. And Stevenson wrote a great book on it. Most of you maybe probably haven't read it, but you know the book, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. This This guy that shows up who's divided and is one thing and then the other. The problem is we don't have that clear division, right? I can't seem to know when am I Dr. Jekyll and when am I Mr. Hyde? When when is that happening? They seem to be so intermixed and so entwined that I can't figure out who's who or when one is there and when the other isn't there. So what does Scripture do with this? What does Scripture tell us is going on? Well, it calls it Wheat and tares, sheep and goats, new man, old man, spirit and flesh. These are the terms that scripture uses to describe this duality in you. So what do you focus on? What are we supposed to focus on? Am am I worthless or do I have infinite value? And I think the answer is yes. In fact, John John did it this way, 1 John uh, 1, 7 through 10. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses, and I love this because it's present, active, indicative, meaning it's happening right now and you can't interfere with it, cleanses us from all of our sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Look, if you go around saying, I, I'm, I'm done, I'm done with sin, I'm going, no, you're, you're deceived. And the truth isn't in us. If, but if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, present active indicative, from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And the word is not in us. Then four verses later, John says this. Whoever says, I know Jesus, I'm following him, 
and does not keep his commandments, he's a liar, and the truth isn't in him. So John's, John's saying here, you're a sinner. You've got to know and acknowledge you're a sinner. And then he goes on and say, and if you keep on sinning, you don't know him. And you're just like, what am I supposed to do? What's the answer? The answer is yes, exactly. You're a sinner, so don't keep on sinning. Sinner, live out your infinite value, you worthless thing. And when we hold that tension, something amazing happens. Here's, I think, one of the best verses that explains this. It's Romans And uh, there's some parentheticals in here that I stuck in here to help us see what Paul is saying. So Romans 7, for I do not understand my own actions, right? Does this sound familiar to you? For I do not do what I want. I know what I should do. That's being a wheat. But I do the very thing I hate. Now I'm acting like a tear. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. I'm being a sheep. So now, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me, that goat in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, which is flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, spirit, but not the ability to carry it out, flesh. For I do not do the good I want. I know the good I want. That's my new man, knowing. But the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. That's my old man. Now, if I do what I do not want, the spirit seeing this activity, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me, my flesh. So, I find, it to, I find this to be a law, that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am. This is where we get amazing grace, right? Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Here's Paul crying out just like we do, God, who's going to save me from myself? I'm really messed up. I mean, how many times have you done that? You go, I know I should have done that, but I did this. And I set out to be this way, but I ended up that way. And I know I should never do that, but I did it again. I mean, how many times do we live this? And it's because that old man, that tear, that goat, that flesh is in you, fighting, trying to tell you you don't need God. And you want to say, I want my desires, my judgment, I want myself. (laughs) Jesus didn't come to save you from the Father. He came to save you from you. Our problem is we tend to forget that we're both these things. And we live in one place or the other. We either live in this worthless, I'm worthless, I'm no good, I can't do anything right, I'm just, I'm just a pain to everybody. And, and, you know, when you do that, you're depressed, you become suicidal, you're a real downer for the rest of us, and you're just hard to be around. And those who live on the other side and forget this part of them, They think of themselves as priceless. They start going into this arrogant, judgmental, impatient, you're kind of an asshole and we don't want to hang around you. So what's the tension? The tension is just that. Don't look in a mirror and walk away and forget who you are. You have infinite value and you have this thing in you that's trying to destroy your own infinite value. You know, truth is... um, I love God. 
and I really want to serve him. And I want to be completely aligned with who he is. And I really love this world. I can't seem to get enough of power and money and fame, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. There's part of me that's really worthless and part of me that's divine and of infinite value. And that's me. And that's you. So, how does God deal with this? I have good news for you. You're all going to burn in hell. Now, what do I mean by that? Because that's been laid pretty pretty complicated since the Dark Ages when hell got a definition that it didn't have in the second century. Look at this verse in Isaiah. Isaiah 66, 23 to 24. This is, Isaiah's done with all his prophecies. He's gotten to the end, and this is what he says. From new moon to new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath, he's basically saying, look, when it's all over and time is in, and it just keeps going on and on, uninterrupted, all flesh, this is a poetic way in Hebrew to say everybody, everybody shall come to worship before me declares the Lord, not hopes the Lord, wishes the Lord. It is his declaration. This is going to happen. All flesh is going to come and worship me. And they, who? All flesh, you and me. They shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me. Who are we looking at? Who are you looking at? You're looking at yourself. And you're going, Oh my gosh, that's disgusting. You know that part of you that, you know, I, I don't know, maybe you're alcoholic and you're short with alcoholism and you get drunk yet again and you go, I hate that part of me. I just hate me. It's laying there. God has it laying there. For their worm, I think this is just amazing. There's a unique worm for you. And their fire, the fire of God tailored for you, shall not be quenched. And they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. You're going to look at yourself and go, oh, that was my old man. That was my flesh. I hated that. And look, God, please don't let that worm die. Please don't let that fire. I don't want that resurrecting and coming back. I want to be free with you. And it's not a coercion. It's not a forced situation. You're going to take joy in the whole scene and in your relationship, your eternal relationship of freedom from that, from you. So what will happen? What will you get? You'll get this. You'll get your deepest desire. What is your deepest desire? Mark 12, 29. Jesus said, they asked him, what's the most important com commandment? Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall, future active indicative, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is this, you shall, future active indicative, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than this. Future act indicative, you know what that means? That means it's going to happen. It will be in a continuous state. You will continue in this state and you have no way to interrupt the process. The judgment of God is this. You shall, it's gonna happen. I know you don't now, but part of you does. There's a new man in you who looks at that and goes, yeah, I want that. I want to love God with everything. I want to love my neighbor as myself. Problem is, I don't know that I really love myself very much. Well, you're going to love what God loves, and that's you. This is going to happen. He's going to make it happen. And the road to get you there, well, I pray you start walking it here, that you embrace Jesus. And take him on, because this is what he did. Right here at communion. 
From communion to the cross to the resurrection, he made it possible to take care of the old man, of the flesh, of the tares, of the goat in you. And he is committed to you to make that happen. It is going to happen. So take joy in that fact. On the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body, broken for you. I'm giving myself to you. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood, my life, shed for you, shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Take my life into you and drink. And as, as we come, I, I, I want to pronounce something over you that's a combination of scriptures and of what God thinks of you. You see, the Lord, he blesses you. He keeps you. He's caused his face to shine on you. He's gracious to you. He's turned his face towards you and he longs for you to be at peace. His favor is on you and on your family and on your children and on their children and their children. His presence goes before you. It's behind you. It's beside you. It's all around you. It is in you. He is with you. When you wake up, when you go to bed, When you leave, when you come back, when you weep, when you rejoice, he's for you. 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 you. Come. Commune with him. In Jesus' name, amen. So I hope you see that um, we just acted out all of Andrew's sermon, which I think was God's sermon, because we started with this question, have you ever been to that place? The truth is, you are that place. You exist in this body of death, this body of flesh. That's like an old stone temple that people build, right? A a temple that's going to turn to dust, this old stone temple. But then you came to this table and received body broken and blood shed, the body of the life, the the reason of God, the Word of God, and the Spirit, the breath is in in the blood. And so you took uh, the breath of God, the very Spirit of God, and you placed it in that old dead stone temple. And that's what Jesus said you are, that you are his temple. But when you have faith, that curtain separating the inner sanctuary from the outer sanctuary, it rips. And what's in the inner sanctuary in the depths of your being ever since your creation begins to invade that old temple. And the old temple becomes a new temple. Your old uh, desires and passion, becomes, they become God's desires and passions because now they're motivated by something else, right? Rather than being motivated by fear and death and shame, they're motivated by love, the passion of God. And what was a vessel of wrath suddenly becomes a vessel of mercy filled with God's mercy. And this is the really beautiful thing, I think, that inner sanctuary of the temple, according to Scripture, is eternal. <laughs> It's the truth about you. This outer part of the temple, the part that we build, it's temporal. It's passing away. But when we believe, that inner part begins to invade that outer part. And you can live from the outer part of your temple. You can live from this part that believes you have created yourself. And in reality, you've created nothing. Because Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. You think you did something, but it's really nothing. And then Paul says this, in Christ, I can do all things all things. And so may you live from the inner part of your temple this week. In other words, may you love because you know that he first loved you. May you love because you sit in the inner sanctuary with Jesus in communion with him and Jesus turns to you and says, let's, 
let's listen to what the Father has to say about us. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. My beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. This is my child. Live from that place, not the other place. And lo and behold, one day you'll open your eyes and all things will have become new. In Jesus' name, believe the gospel. Amen. If you'd like prayer, members of the prayer team will be down front here with you. And uh, if you want to, drop something in the plate on your way up. But have a great week and read Romans chapter 2. Amen. Mm-hmm.